All right, there we go. All right, thanks for waiting. All right. Um, so, to, like I said last class, uh, for today's lecture, we're not doing anything new material or a new topic. We're going to spend some time talking about project number three, because um, next, next class, you guys are going to have to, after spring break, you guys are going to have to propose uh, the topic you're going to work on in your group. And then I want to spend some time talking about the extra credit. And there's nothing on the website for, for both of these uh, beyond what's, what's been there before. Uh, but we'll, I'll release that later in the week with the full explanation of, of everything that I talk about here. All right, so obviously we're just going to talk about Project 3 topics and extra credit. So let's jump right into this. So uh, the idea for Project number 3 is that everyone's, we, every group is going to be required to implement some substantial component or feature or uh, technology or functionality in the Peloton database system. So the idea is that everyone here should be trying to incorporate ideas and topics that we talked about in the class, uh, not just to what we've gone so far, but also looking ahead, some of the topics that are coming down the pipeline for us. Um, and then if there's anything also you want to do as, as part of your own research or you want to tie into our database system, by all means, uh, you can do that as well. So the only, the only restriction that I have is, is that it has to be something that everyone in the group equally contributes to. Um, and it has to be, you, the project topic has to be unique from every other project topic uh, from everybody else in, in the class, right? We don't want two people implementing the exact same thing because that's not that in interesting. So the project three, we've talked about this in the beginning, but I'm going to spend some time talking a little bit more now that we're further along in the course. It's really going to be comprised of five components. All right, so we'll go through each of these one by one. The proposal, which is, what, which is due on the first Monday after spring break, it's just going to be a five-minute presentation to the class about the high-level topic that, you're, you, that you plan to pursue. And so you, you want to be able to specify a little bit, talk about a little bit about what you think is going to actually have to change in the database system in order for you to implement your, your project. Right? It just, I don't want you to say, oh, like I, here's what I want to do, you know, this magical thing, without really thinking through and looking at the code and making decisions about whether that's feasible um, you know, from now until the end of the semester. So you want to talk about also to how you plan to test and imp uh, your implementation to check and see whether it's correct and performs well. And then you, you want to specify what workloads you're going to use to evaluate your project. And this is why I've been asking you guys to write down when you re review the papers what workloads all these other uh, people have used in their database systems and their research projects because that, that'll tell you what you should be using for yours. Um, and I, I'm more than happy to also to, to, to guide you in the right direction. So the, uh, we're not going to film the, uh, the, all the project proposals, right? So don't feel like that you're going to be embarrassed to say something and then it's going to end up on video, right? It's just going to be us. Uh, so, you know, and I end up me being a dick and ask really hard questions, but it's not going to be in video, so it won't be, no one will rem remember after the class is over. So feel free to, you know, really discuss and try to think through what, what you actually want to say. So then later on in the semester, and I, I forget what the date is, but it's, it's marked on the website, but you'll have a status update uh, to the class as well to say, here's what we've done so far, here's how things are coming along, um, and whether you have decided to pivot or change your project topic in any way. And this is just really a checkpoint for everyone to make sure that everyone's sort of making the same amount of progress across, across the board. Right? We don't want one group super far ahead and one group super far behind. Uh, Joe and I plan to be, you know, meet with you regularly as needed to make sure that you're making progress as well. But this is just sort of an update to the, the entire class. So now when we get to the end of the semester, uh, and we actually want to start turning in our code, there's three additional things we're going to have to do, or three, three steps in part of this. The first is that I'm going to require every group to get paired up with another group to do a code review. And we're going to set up a website uh, through GitHub. Uh, there's, a, there's websites that can leverage GitHub's um, you know, issue tracking services, but you can, we can allow you to do a code review and provide feedback to another group and say what they should or should not be doing to, to you know, update their code or maybe improve their implementation. And the idea here is to get you comfortable and familiar with sort of modern coding practices that you encounter when you go work at a major company and do, you'll have to do code reviews there. Right? So I'll spend some time in the lecture and, uh, before we get to this point saying what I expect of all of you and sort of the general approach you should take when doing uh, code reviews. 
And the grading for this will be based on the participation, right? If you just sort of wing it and say, like, you didn't, you use tabs instead of spaces, right? If that's all you say in your code review, then that's going to be insufficient, right? Right? It's really, it's, it's not, it's really meant to be, to have you learn how to do code reviews and also improve your own code by getting feedback from your peers, okay? And then we'll do a final presentation. So they haven't released the, uh, the final exam schedule yet, or at least I, I, I've seen it. I don't know if you guys have seen it. Uh, so whenever we're, our final exam date is, that's when we'll have the a presentation. So we'll have food, we'll have pizza or whatever, and everyone will spend 10 minutes and discuss what was the final outcome of their implementation, right? Um, and if you can do, you want to be able to do some kind of performance benchmarks or evaluation of your work to say, like, you know, we implemented this, this speed improvement of this optimization. Here's what this, the, 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 the throughput we had before, and here's the throughput afterwards. You want to show that your thing actually works and does, you know, makes the system better in the way that you, you were seeking to do. If you have any kind of demo of, of you know, live demo of your system, of your, of your project to the class, that would be really awesome too, but that's not required. All right, so now, once we get through the code review, once you get through the final presentation, There'll be the final code drop, and whatever we'll schedule this to be whatever the, you know, the I had to turn in final grades for everyone in the semester. But the basic idea is that everybody, everybody's project is not considered done and complete until we have a pull request from you in GitHub that can merge cleanly into the master branch, right? And so this that, that, this pull request is going to have to include also the uh, not just the implementation but also the, t the test cases as well as documentation about what your feature is or what your project is, how it can be used, and what are some trade-offs that you make in, made in the implementation, what are some future work things you'd want to have if you, ha if you had more time to, to, to work on your project. Again, these are all the things we expect from you in, in order to say that your project is done. So now I realize when you do pull requests and you want to do a merge on the master, if, the if there's somebody else does a bunch of changes and that gets merged in, your merge will no longer could possibly no longer merge in cleanly as, uh, because somebody else came in before you. So what we'll do to make this fair, we'll just randomly select the merge order for every single group uh, so that you just have to make sure your, your merge you know, can merge in the master that came before you. Because right? what we don't want is everyone merging on the current master and then as we start merging all the pull requests in, we can't cleanly merge another groups. right? So we'll just do this in random order, and again, I will, I will be um, lenient in, you know, for like the last group if, there's, if they have problems, right? The first person should be, the first group that gets you know, the first slot has the easiest job, right? They just merge on the master. Uh, so I'll be a bit more strict on them, but if you're at the end, again, I, um, I, I, we, we can help out. Okay, any questions about this? And again, I'll write out exactly what I mean for all these steps and put a post on the website later this week. All right, so now I want to spend some time talking about some potential project topics that you guys could pursue uh, in, you know, for your project three. So this is by no means an exhaustive list. These are just some, some, some ideas that, I've, that Joy and I have thought through that we think might be kind of interesting that, for you guys to, to look at and, and try out. So again, if there's something that you're doing in your own research that you want to apply to our, uh, to our, our system, right, so Joy is really interested in, in like pornography. So if you want to do something with pornography in our database system, like Joy wants to, then by all means you can go ahead and do that, right? So again, this is not an exhaustive list. If there's something else that you want to pursue, you know, talk to me, and we can see whether it's 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 right for the for Project Three. So I'm going to go through each of these one by one, just say a little bit about what it is, and then what I think what you'll have to actually have to do in the system to 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 complete the project or make it work. Um, and for some of them, I'll say like you know, a stretch goal or bonus goal will be like, hey, look, if you have enough time, here's something else you could you could do as well. That would be kind of cool. So again, stop me as we go along if you have any questions. All right. So the first one is probably I think the most interesting and probably the most important one is that the our current database system, since we're built on top of Postgres, we're, we're using a lot of Postgres internals. It still relies on the Postgres Query Planner and Optimizer. Uh, which is inherently disk-based, right? A, the query planner has this catalog of statistics, and it's using that to determine what the best query plan it is for a particular query. And it's, and it's the cost model it's using for its internals to make a decision about whether one plan is better than another is based on the number of disk blocks it has to read, right? 
which obviously doesn't make sense if you have an in-memory database because there's no disk I.O. So the other issue we have is that the Postgres plan and the Peloton plan are not exactly compatible. So what happens is the Postgres query planner generates some query plan tree, and then we have these transform function that converts it to what our plan should look like. Right? And so it's not, that's not a huge major overhead, but it's, non, it's, it's, it's non-trivial. So for this project, uh, I think a really cool topic would be to actually implement a new in-memory uh, database system query planner and optimizer uh, that can emit directly the Peloton plans. So then, then we, we can get rid of the Postgres stuff entirely. And so what I think would be kind of cool about this is that there's a lot of um, newer features in C++11, like Lambda functions, that this query optimizer could use. And it would be a sort of a better, more flexible implementation than sort of the standard heuristic uh, approach that the older systems like Postgres use. Um, there's also other sort of modern optimization, optimization algorithms you can consider as well. Um, so Postgres actually has two query optimizers. It has sort of a, gen, a, a simplistic uh, rule-based one. But then if, it ha if it's, the query gets too complicated, it switches into, switches into a genetic algorithm. Right? So that's something that we could, we could consider uh, for this project as well. The MemSQL guys actually have a uh, C++11 uh, query optimizer that's based on Lambda functions that they claim uh, allows them to do some really cool things that the, the rule-based stuff doesn't allow, allow you to do. So the, for this project, obviously writing a query optimizer from scratch is a lot of work. And so for this, you wouldn't necessarily have to support all the possible different types of operators and query plans that Postgres does. And certainly because we, could, we don't support that in our system yet. But the idea is that if you just had the bare, you know, if, if your optimizer could mi implement the bare minimum amount of SQL stuff that we need for our system, and you wrote it in such a way that it was, could be easily extended later on, then that would be really helpful. Because then you know, two years later or next year, if we have another class, you know, the next student can build off of what you've done and, and improve it even further. So any questions about this? OK. Uh, the next project topic is to add uh, vectorization support or vectorized execution inside the system. So we sort of talked about this a little bit when we talked about the sort merge join, about using SIMD instructions to, to speed up uh, the, the sort process or hashing. And so the idea is that for this, we want to be able to implement the same kind of uh, SIMD stuff, but directly in the query executors for, for the database system. Uh, so we'll talk more about vectorized execution after spring break. But the basic idea is that you would use SIMD to speed up scan, sorting, hashing the same way that you sort of saw with the, um, uh, with, with the sort merge stuff. So for this, I think a key part of it, and we'll see this a lot in the, some of the other projects, is that it's really important that you just don't blow away the non-vectorized code in, in the system, right? Because what you want to be able to do is have a little flag in either a compile time or a configuration file that says, yes, I should use uh, vector, vectorized ex uh, execution. And that way you can test to see whether your new improved implementation of these operators outperforms the existing code. Right? If you just blow away the, the old stuff, uh, then you would have to use the, you know, the old master branch that may not have the fixes that you're going to put in place uh, to, to fix other parts of the system um, as you do this. So I think it's really important to make sure that you have, you have both of these things in order to test you test and evaluate them. The next project is to add better support for logging and checkpoints recovery. So currently we have a simplified write ahead log scheme that does uh, physical logging of, for all the changes that transactions make. But it is by no means as sophisticated as the silo R stuff or some of the other papers that we talked about. Um, and we can't, even, you know, we can't reload the database after restart either. Right? We have basically we can log at runtime and that's enough. Uh, so for this project, we want to optimize w the current lo runtime logging scheme to improve it, basically do some of the stuff that Silo is doing. Um, we want to implement checkpoints, uh, and it's up to you to decide whether you can do fuzzy checkpoints or consistent checkpoints. And then you want to implement the uh, recovery from the checkpoint and recovery from the log. And I think for this, it would be interesting to do the, the completely parallelized version that, that Silo R does, rather than the single-threaded version. Now the project is to do materialized views and triggers. So if you don't know what a materialized view is, essentially it's like a it's like a, it's like a regular view, sort of a virtual table. Uh, but the 
underlying backing storage for that view is updated anytime the table is updated. So view, for example, so if you declare a view and you do a query on that view, it basically runs that query every single time you access the view. But in the materialized view, it sort of maintains it over time in the background. And then when you query against it, it doesn't have to run the full query. It already has the, the output ready for it. So the way you implement materialized views is essentially you use triggers that allow you to say, whenever there's an update to the underlying backing table for the view, update my materialized view. And this can be either the, the naive case of just re-executing the entire query again, or you can do an incremental update, which we'll talk about later, using deltas and things like that to allow you to, to just change the, the, or only access a small part of the underlying table but that's backing the materialized view uh, whenever it's updated without having to scan the entire thing. So for this, to implement this in Peloton, well, we don't have any notion of views, or regular views, or even triggers at this point, but we can leverage a lot of what's already in Postgres's catalog to specify what the triggers or what the views should actually be. So there's a lot of stuff we can use for Postgres. It's just taking that information out of the Postgres catalog and then populating you know, your own implementation of it at runtime and, and then being able to put insert the the actions at certain points of updates to the tables to fire off the triggers. A bonus idea uh, that I think would be really cool, because I'm not sure actually how hard this, doing incremental updates on materialized views, as we'll see later, is, is non-trivial. Uh, but you might be able to take some shortcuts to make it go faster. So this, this may be really easy. So one thing that would be really kind of cool to extend this even further is once you have triggers, then you can now implement a pub sub interface that allow the database system to stream updates out to, 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 to a message broker or a message queue like Kafka. So you think of something like you have your front end LTB database system that's running Peloton, you insert new tuples into it, and then there's a pub sub interface that gets fired off with a trigger that allows you to publish updates out to something like Kafka downstream. That's a very common uh, implementation or architecture used in sort of very large scale applications. So I would consider this, be, this would be kind of a bonus thing that I think, I think would be pretty cool. And again, it would, be, it would cause you to become familiar with not only Postgres's catalogs and not only ha how to implement triggers, but also like an ex another system that's widely used uh, in industry. Uh, the next project is to do concurrent schema changes. So it's very important in your database system to be able to do alter table and add and drop columns, add tables, change the, uh, change the um, the layout of tables, change the ordering of columns, things like that. And we obviously want to do this, do, apply these changes while we continue to execute transactions and queries. So for this project, we want to be able to implement these concurrent scheming changes with, at, with having minimal overhead or minimal impact on the runtime execution of queries. Right now, I don't think we can do any add table or all, we can't do any alter table in our system. So this is basically imp implementing everything from scratch. But what I think is cool about this in a main memory database system using our tile-based architecture is that you can do lazy updates or lazy propagation of schema changes to the database system that's not quite possible in other systems. So when you call alter table in something like Postgres uh, it, it, or MySQL, it scans through every single tuple and every single table and applies the change. But in our case, say we add a column, uh, we don't necessarily have to go and modify the, the, the physical storage of the tuples that, in their tiles. We can just put a little flag to say, hey, yeah, you added this column, but this tile doesn't have it. So if anybody tries to access it, use the default value. Or if they do a delete a column, and rather than going through and applying the change right away, you just say, you know, in the same thing, if the head of the tile group or head of the tile, this column is deleted, so don't let anybody try to access it. And then over time, as you, as you, as you continue to access uh, data or reorganize the tiles, you can then apply the changes. So this would be actually a really cool project um, that allow you to get you know, a significant speed up over what the existing systems uh, can do today. And obviously what we'll need, what we'll need is a, to impl implement our own internal catalog, reusing as much as we can for Postgres to keep track of the different schema versions that are out there. All right, the next project is to implement constraints. So constraints are things like, yeah, sorry. One question about streams, so do all these benchmarks actually alter the tables? I mean, the kind of benchmarks we have seen? The question is, do the benchmarks we've seen alter the tables? No. 
Yeah, that's actually that's a good question. So his question is, like, we looked at TPCC, we looked at TPCH. Do any of these things have alter table? And the answer is no. Uh, that would be actually an implementing, interesting benchmark to implement. That's almost like you get a publication on that one. But like, here, here's the alter table benchmark. That'd be kind of cool. It's not hard to think of like, you know, simple experiments to test that though, All right? I'll talk a little bit how we can do uh, sort of SQL level testing in a second. All right, so the next project is to do uh, implement constraints. So constraints are like not null, check if something's greater than, than, than you know, zero, less than zero. Um, and these are important because they allow, this is how the database system is going to enforce you, not only value integrity, but referential integrity of, of the different uh, tuples. And so for this, I'm, as far as I know, I don't, we don't have any support for constraints at this point. You might have simple things like not null. Uh, but to do more complicated expressions, like in a check clause, uh, that's something that you can implement here. And so you could start off with sort of the simple constraints, right? check if the value is greater than zero, stuff like that, uh, and leveraging the existing expression system that we already have, that you already used for, um, for the join and the BW tree. But then the next step, the final step would be actually to implement foreign key constraint checking, which is a little more complicated because you have to look up in an index to see whether the foreign key you're trying to reference actually exists or not. And then you have to do, actually implement all the cascading um, deletes as well. So this, this is a lot of work uh, for the internals, um, but this would be something very cool because it would touch a lot, a lot of different parts of the, the runtime system. All right, next is to implement user-defined user functions. So UDFs are a way to declare like a function that takes a tuple in and can return back a value. So you can apply some kind of complex logic on, the, on that particular data item that you wouldn't normally be able to do using this, the, the sort of the standard SQL functions. And so for this, we, we implement basically from scratch uh, ability to take something like PL SQL uh, for, for the create function table, load that into the Postgres catalog, and then be able to uh, use it inside of the Peloton expression subsystem, right? So if you have this, you know, a where clause could use, you, could, a where clause could use in the UDF, uh, your join clause could use the UDF, and the UDF could be, and the select clause as well. So be able, be able to use the UDF in all different parts of the system. And I think that if you just get it in the expression subsystem in the correct way, it just automatically can be used everywhere else. Because we, 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 we reuse it, we use this, the same subsystem everywhere. All right, the next project is to do enhanced indexes. So we are still up in the air. For our system, what is the best index to use? Right, so we, we've talked about skip lists, we talked about BW trees, we talked about the art index. We don't know what we want to use just yet. Uh, but the BW tree project is a good start for, for this project. So the idea would be you've already implemented the, probably I think this, the second most complicated index, the BW tree, the, B plus, the concurrent B plus tree is more complicated. Uh, but the idea is the now implement the other, uh, the other guys and do an evaluation, do a benchmarking, and try to understand which one actually performs the best. Um, for this one, we may have to modify the current index API that we have in Peloton to be able to incorporate all, all of these things. Um, and then the, the goal would be maybe at the end of the semester, whatever one we think is the best for all possible different workloads, we just plop that in there and that whatever index you build is the one we actually want to use. And for this, another cool thing, if this is, turns out to be really simple, if, like, if you ignore the B plus tree and just do these other, other two guys, uh, a, a bonus project or a stretch goal would be to actually implement an inverted index that allows you to do full text queries. We're not really going to talk about inverted indexes in this, in this class, but the basic idea is like, in order to speed up a like command or, or string value expression, you can do a inverted index um, that maps words to tuples or, or strings to in, in, individual strings in a text field to tuples. And then it's really fast to look at that. And, but to how do you maintain this while you execute transactions at the same time is non-trivial. All right, so in next class, or, or after you guys do the proposals, we'll start the lecture on database compression. The basic idea here is we're going to allow the database system to compress parts of the, of, of the database in memory to reduce the amount of storage overhead it has for that data, but as well as re reduce the amount of data we have to process while we execute queries. 
So we already saw this when we talked about the bitmap indexes for SQL Server. Right? They use value encoding, delta, and then we talked about delta encoding, dictionary encoding, and then sort of the naive block compression where you just take a block of memory and run gzip or snappy on it. So the idea was to implement all these different schemes in the system and then evaluate them for different workloads and see how well they perform. Uh, for this, you probably need to implement new query operators that can access compressed memory directly, right? Because otherwise, if you just say the naive compression, for the naive block compression, you just decompress it before, and you can decompress it and feed it into the existing operators. But for these other guys, you want them to be able to operate directly on the encoded data without decompressing them to reduce the amount of data you're passing from one operator to the next. Right? This is that late materialization stuff we talked about. A bonus project or stretch goal would be actually implement logic in the database system, either based on heuristics or some kind of machine learning uh, algorithm that can figure out what would be the ideal compression scheme to use for different parts of the database based on how we observe queries accessing it. Right? Next project is to do, uh, to actually add support for multi-threaded or intra-query intra parallelism. Um, so currently, since we're, we're, we are still leveraging bits and pieces of Postgres, Postgres can only execute, can only execute one, use one thread per query, and we have that same restriction. Um, so we can only have one, one single worker thread can operate on a transaction in a query at, as it goes along. So this would be like to be able to have intra-query parallelism, sort of the same thing we saw in Hyper with Morsel, the, the Morsel-driven architecture, where for a single query, we can break it up it's, it's, it's sort of sub-queries up and have them run on different threads at the same time, and then we can combine the result at the end to produce a single answer. For this, you'd have to implement the exchange operators to modify the query plans, and that's sort of the standard approach that everybody does. So for this as well, another thing that a bonus project would be to actually implement the, the morsel NumaWare partitioning or data placement that they use to explicitly put blocks of data on, on one socket versus another, and then know how to schedule threads to only operate on, on, on local data. And for this, we need to update or add additional information to our internal catalog that says, you know, this block for this table is at located this socket, and therefore I know what threads can go and access it. The, uh, the last couple project, the last project is to do integrated memcache. If you don't know what memcache is, it's sort of the most common caching system that's used in sort of large-scale applications. Um, you can think of it like it's, it's an in-memory key value store where you can just call get and set on, on objects. And the idea is that when you, uh, instead of running a query against your database, you look in memcache to see whether the, you know, based on the primary key, whether the object you want is already there. And then the problem with memcache, though, is that when a application modifies an object, it has to go invalidate the, the cached object in memcache to make sure that nobody reads stale data. So a lot of times what people actually want is the ability to use a memcache-like API directly on the database system and then completely avoid having to uh, maintain the, the, the cache in, in the separate memcache system. Um, this is actually something that the uh, hedge funds want to use and uh, a lot of people can do this, a lot of people do this, use this in MySQL as well, because MySQL supports a memcache protocol directly in, in, in ODB. So the, the idea is that instead of calling, you know, select star from table or primary key equals something, you just call get with the key, and the internal system can just go and get the actual object as if it was executing a query. So for this, you'd want to implement the memcache protocol in a network handler thread inside of, our, inside of our database system, and then based on whether it's a get or a put or a delete, then you would invoke a prepared statement query that would then just do the same operation. So from the outside, it looks like memcache, but internally, you're just executing these sort of one query transactions that have been predefined to go do the thing you need to do. So it's not clear to me how easy this is actually going to be. It's not clear how easy it's going to be implement the, the memcache protocol in our system. Um, from what I've read, it's fairly simple, but you, you know, it's the devil's in the details. So if this turns out to be super easy, what would be also useful or helpful or interesting is to also rewrite basically all our client connection handling code that we have in our system because we're still relying on, on Postgres stuff. So we can come up with a more thread-optimized way um, of, of doing these things and handing off query requests from the clients and passing them off to, to the worker threads. So if memcache turns out to be super easy, uh, this would be the next, next thing to look at.
OK, any questions about these projects? All right, so a big part of implementation of project number three is, is testing. So you've already done the sort of the unit tests for the BW tree and the hash join. Uh, we're also going to provide you with a SQL based regression test, testing suite, that can allow you to check to see whether your project breaks any high level functionalities or, or features in the database system. So the idea is that it would be this Python testing framework that will have all these different permutations and variations of SQL statements, transactions, alter table commands. And then as you implement your thing, if you want to say, oh, did I break you know, count queries, you could run this testing suite and it'll, it'll check these things for you. So this is not meant to be exhaustive, and the, the unit test cases aren't, aren't meant to be exhaustive. So every group is going to be required to, to extend either the regression test suite or the unit test to check to see whether your project actually works. We won't accept any project that does not do uh, you know, thorough testing of, of their implementation. We may, not do, we may or may not enforce code coverage tests, which I'll talk about later. But the idea is that you want to have test cases that touches, touch all different parts of your code. Um, since there's so much existing Postgres code, we might not enforce that. But it, we will we'll set up something for, you, for everyone to, to, to see whether, for their own code, their test cases cover things. Uh, I didn't write anything down here, but we also have a build and test server here at CMU that every group will have access to. So the idea is that you'll, you'll tell me what is the, you know, what's the main repository you guys are going to use for your implementation. And then we'll set it up so that at any time that somebody pushes code to GitHub, our system will pull down the changes, run, bot, comp compile it, and run all the tests and give you back a notification when someone breaks the build. Right, this is called continuous integration, or, uh, continuous building. So we use something called Jenkins, and we'll set that up for everyone here. To let, so as you go along and push, push changes, you make sure that you're not breaking things. Okay. For the computing resources, the hardware that MemSQL graciously, uh, graciously donated to us has arrived. It showed up last week. Um, it's in my office like this. It's still in the boxes, uh, but we're working on getting it out. Um, but each machine, it's, we're going to have three machines. Each machine will have a dual socket Xeon uh, that has six cores with 12 threads. So on each box, there'll be a total of 24 threads, 12 real ones, 24 with hyper-threading. And then each box will also have 16 gigabytes of DDR4. We're working on, on, uh, on increasing that. So we're, we, the goal for next week on, on spring break is that we're going to set up these, these machines in the database, lab, database group lab. And that way, when we come back, we can give everyone access to, to these things. And we want to use what's called Ubuntu MOS as metal as a service. So rather than getting a VM, you would you'd be able to provision the actual machine and have exclusive access to it while you do your experiments and while you do your, your testing. And then when you're done, you would release it, and then the next group can come along and, and use it. Okay. But, and so if anybody has experience setting up Ubuntu MOS, please email us, uh, because this is the first time we're doing it. We're going to make sure that we, we do it right. So the other thing is that for doing the actual benchmarking evaluation, we don't want anyone to have to rewrite TPCC or TPCH. So the good news is we already have a testing framework that has all of the benchmarks that you'd want to use for, for your project. So it's called OLATP Bench. This is something that I wrote with other people when I was in grad school. Um, it's a Java-based framework that has 15 benchmarks already built in, ready to go. So we have mostly OLATP benchmarks, so TPCC, TATP, YCSB, Wikipedia, uh, Twitter, ePinions, a bunch of other ones. And then we have only two OLAP ones, CH Benchmark, which is from the Hyper Guys, which is just a simplified version of TPCH. And then TPCH Benchmark is the one you guys have been seeing. So we don't support TPCDS at this point. But the idea is I don't want anybody to have to write TPCC themselves, right? I wrote it five times when I was in grad school. Joy's already, already written it twice, and he's only been in grad school for three years. So no one should write TPCC themselves. Definitely use our, our existing implementation. It'll save you a ton of time. Um, I'll also say that we've only tested, for the most part, TPCC and YCSB. We're working on testing the other benchmarks. And for TPCH, there are some SQL operators we currently don't support, but we're working on adding them. Things like like uh, some some simple math functions and things like that. So at this point, we can't run this thing entirely. Uh, but the goal is that by the end of the semester, when you actually want to start benchmarking your project, it'll be available for you. So this is the link, and that which, uh, for for more information, it'll just take you to the um, 
to the GitHub account with, with, with the repository. Um, there's enough people in here at CMU that has, have, has experience with, with LTV Bench. So even though we're throwing, you, throwing another piece of code at you, uh, there's enough people you can talk to, myself included, that could help you get this running. And we have scripts that can do this in, with Peloton, can set things up and run with Peloton uh, already for you. OK? All right, so again, reminder for project number three, every group has to do a five-minute proposal on March 6th when we come back after spring break. But I, my, both myself and Joy will be around. We have a deadline on March 7th, but after that, we should be available. Um, that's, that's next week, isn't it? That's not right. So it should be, what is it? It should be the 13th. Um, so for March 13th, we'll have, we'll do the proposal. And um, still not ready even here. Like, what is, what is today's date? Let's get this right. Today's the second, so it'd be the 14th. Yes, thank you. Let's just do that now. So everyone come back. We'll do, we'll do the proposal. Um, and I, if you need to talk with me during this time, boom. OK, good. Uh, just email me or come, come to my regular office hours on Monday and Wednesday. OK? Any questions about project three? Yes? Who decides to do the same thing? You can find out in the parking lot. <laughs> uh, so, what I would do is I will send a link, I would, I would send out from Piazza a spreadsheet uh, you know, with all the group numbers and just put your topic in there. And it's whoever gets there first. So, don't, don't be stupid and go try to delete the other group. <laughs> <laughs> they stole your idea because I can go see the versions and, and, and it will change. Yes, the kid in the back. Uh. <laughs> So I think uh, we can give them like three choices, uh, and uh, then we can figure things out. What do you mean three choices? The three projects they want to like work on, and then we can. Uh, yeah, I, if you really like, so, it's not really a goal restaurant. Yeah, just we're all friends, um, so there's no need to be super competitive. Uh, we'll take it on a case by case basis. Right? If, if, if everyone's dying to do the query optimizer, then, then we'll figure something out. But I think there's enough topics where we should be, we should be spread, spread out on And there's two more things here that, that I didn't list that I know that other people have already been talking to me about doing. So, any other questions? All right, so again, the, the, the project three, I think, is 45% of the final grade. So this is the, the main thing I want you guys to focus on. And we'll do some more lectures again, talk as we go throughout the semester to talk about how do you how do you navigate and work in a large code base that contains a bunch of stuff that you didn't write, and the you know and the people that wrote it aren't around anymore. Okay. All right. So to finish up, we'll talk about extra credit. So uh, we I am offering 10% extra credit for every single student in the class uh, if they write a encyclopedia style article about a database management system. So it doesn't have to be a commercial system. It doesn't have to be my system, right? It can be any system you want. It can be academic. It could be uh, a system that's still around. It's a system that was in the past. The idea is that the, the article should, con should discuss all the major topics that we discuss in this class, right? What kind of concurrent control scheme does it use? What kind of logging scheme does it use? Does it do query compilation? Does it do vectorization? What kind of join algorithms do they support? How do they support them? And so rather than having everything just be sort of be free form text, like you know, you'd say, why, why, why don't we just do this on Wikipedia? Well, in Wikipedia, if you look at the articles for different database systems, they all contain different types of information, right? And they don't use the same terminology. All right, so the idea is that the encyclopedia we're trying to create here at CMU has a standard taxonomy that we can then use to do comparisons across these different database systems to see, to see different, you know, ask different questions. Like, is MVCC really the most common, you know, approach used in, in modern systems, or has it always been that way? So for, what we'll do is we'll have a taxonomy that you would use for your article, and then we'll have predefined options to say, you know, for concurrent call, it uses two-phase locking, it uses MVCC, it uses OCC. So you don't have to write, write it in, just select what's there. And then you'll need to provide a summary paragraph with citations that sort of uh, elaborate uh, what's going on for that particular feature. So if they say they use two-phase locking, uh, you would write in the summary paragraph to say they're using strict two-phase locking, they're using deadlock detection or deadlock prevention, right? So the idea is that we'll have 
things you can click and specify what the options are, and then we'll have some additional space for you to clarify what's going on. So the website we're building to host this encyclopedia is the URL is dbdb.io. It currently is locked down because uh, it's not available for the public yet, but I'll post the user and password on Piazza so everyone can take a look. The current version of the website is incomplete. It's not what you'll be, end up be using, and we're still working on development of it, but, but I want to announce this now to get people thinking about, about the, the, what they want to do, and then we, it'll be made available uh, in, in a week or so. So just like for fighting over project, uh, project three topics, we'll have a sign-up sheet to allow you to specify what database manager system you want, you want to choose. And then just to be fair, we'll say it's first come, first serve. Um, but I'll say that you may think that it's better to pick something like MySQL or, 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 or MongoDB or, or the more popular database systems that are out there today. Uh, because there's going to be a lot of information, but that means I don't expect you to have a really uh, well-documented and really comprehensive article about that particular system. But if you choose an obscure system that maybe is around the 1980s that only, you know, you know, was only has a few publications and it was saw a little commercial success, uh, you're obviously going to have less information to cite and 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 use in order to write your article, but it's going to be a, you know, a bit more work than the MySQL case because you're going to have to you know, struggle to find this information. So it's sort of a trade-off between these two, and I don't know, at this point, I don't know, I don't know which one's easier. Um, so just to give you an idea of what DBD, DBD, DBDBIO is going to look like, so you'll have this like, form uh, that you can then select the different options and then fill in the paragraphs, and then there'll be information about the citations you can add at the bottom, and then there'll be some uh, sort of generic information that says, like, you know, when was the system started, when did it, uh, you know, when did, was it finished, who actually owns it, what language is it written in, things like that. And then we'll have, like, there's a search feature that I'll specify all these different feature categories that you would specify here. You can then select which of these, uh, you know, which of these to search for and look at time series and things like that. So this is obviously, you don't write, you guys don't write this, but this is based on the information that you provide uh, in here in the standard taxonomy. Um, so my current list of database systems that I found, uh, I've been sort of keeping track of this list for the last couple years because uh, I knew eventually I wanted to do this project. I currently have 456 different database systems. Uh, so there should be no problem you finding one that you, that you think is interesting that you want, you want to write about. Um, and again, these include both academic ones and uh, commercial ones. Uh, again, if you need to pick them, Here's, a, here, you know, here's just a, in no particular order, a smattering of different database systems uh, that I have logos for. So again, you can pick any, any, any one of these. Okay? I'm not endorsing any, you know, any one system over another. I think they all do different things, and it's all, diff it's all very interesting. Okay, so uh, I warned you guys in the beginning about this in the semester, and I'll say it again, that this article that you're going to provide for us has to be your own writing and, and has to have your own images and diagrams. It means you can't just copy and paste whatever you find on the web and just put it in the article. I don't care that they, they wrote it better than you could ever write it. That's not the, what we do here at CMU. That's considered plagiarism. So everything has to be in your own words. And you have to provide proper attributions and uh, citations for anything that, that you're referencing in your article. Right? And if I find that you're cheating or, or, or stealing content from other people, then not only will I not give you the extra credit, I'll fail you, fail you in the course, right? Right, because what we want to do is we want to put this website out, make it a public service, we'll license everything as Creative Commons, uh, and so that, you know, we have, it, people can, can use this, and so it's not going to help us if, if the, stuff you, your, the stuff we wrote about and, and, is stolen. Okay, so, damn, my dates are way wrong. Oh, there we go, that's right, March 14th. All right. Project two, again, is due next Wednesday at midnight. I gave you guys a week extension. Um, and again, we're going to be a bit more stricter and harsher about how we do a test and uh, check to see whether your source code is good or not. And then project three proposals will be due on the Monday, March 14th, the, after you guys get back from spring break. And of course, I'll be available during my regular office hours or by appointment to discuss what you want to do for project three. And I'll send email out later today with the sign up for the extra credit and sign up for the project three topics. Any questions? 
Actually, I did, I did have one point I, want, uh, I wanted to bring up. So someone asked about using a, a library for project number two in the BW tree. Um, for that, I don't think we want to we want to use outside stuff. But for project number three, by all means, you're allowed to use anything that you find that you, that you want to use for your implementation. Uh, I would say we want to limit you to just either Apache, MIT, or BSD uh, license code. Um, and if you need to use like a library, a package, make sure that it's can be part, it's part of like the standard Debian or Ubuntu you know, repository. Right? If this is an obscure library that you have to download specifically install, then we should talk about whether that's the right thing to do or not. Okay? But again, you just can't. Don't take any GPL code. Don't take any other you know, other non Apache license uh, compatible code. And again, I'll, I'll write up what I mean by this on Piazza on the website. Okay? We're done. See you guys. Enjoy your spring break. Nobody get in trouble. Nobody get arrested. Nobody get herpes. It's never good for anybody.